Okay, so speaking of the atmosphere, um, we can't really see the surface if we try to look at Venus with just visible light. And uh, the reason is because its entire surface is covered by a thick layer of clouds. And those clouds are made primarily of sulfuric acid. Um, and they're about 20 kilometers thick. And this covers a 30 kilometer troposphere. So if you were on Venus's surface, it would be sort of, you know, uniformly warm. Um, there would be some gentle breeze, but never strong winds uh, because it's all, its entire surface is uniformly warm. So there's not very much uh, temperature difference from place to place to cause strong winds to form. Uh, and you would be basically like seeing the light from the sun being filtered through these yellow clouds. And it would be pretty dim, be, like as if it was a very overcast day on earth, but yellow. So pretty creepy from my perspective. Um, but anyway, you wouldn't want to stand on the surface because the 88 atmospheres of pressure would be absolutely crushing. So compared to the uh, pressure on the surface of the earth, right at sea level, Earth's atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. Um, if you've ever gone scuba diving or anything, um, 30 feet underwater, the pressure is two atmospheres. So this is already something that, you know, divers have to dive slowly to acclimate to that amount of pressure. Uh, so you can imagine what a huge difference 88 atmospheres would be. And then the surface temperature is uniformly about 750 Kelvin. This is above the melting point of lead. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, we've landed a probe there. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, these are the Venera mission uh, from the Soviet Union in, I want to say the 1970s. They landed a probe and they took these photos before their probe melted down. So it's not a very inviting place to explore the surface, unlike Mars, where we regularly send probes to go do various missions. The engineering to even get the probe to the surface without, you know, burning up in the thick atmosphere and also being battered by these sulfuric acid clouds. Um, yeah, the engineering has to be outstanding. Okay, so we can get a feel for the surface features if we can somehow peer under those clouds. Okay, I'm seeing most votes for C imaging radar, and that's exactly right. So. Um, ultraviolet telescope would not be helpful. Laser light is a visible light wavelength. So we, we haven't talked about this, but the, um, the spectrum of light spans uh, visible light. So the colors that we see, uh, infrared light, which is the heat that we discuss in the greenhouse effect, ultraviolet light, which is higher energy light than visible. And then farther down on the low energy side of the scale is uh, radio. So that radio light is able to penetrate the sulfuric acid clouds instead of the visible light, which reflects off and the ultraviolet light also reflects off. The infrared light is absorbed in the atmosphere, so it can't reach the surface, bounce off and come back to the, um, the spacecraft. But radio, uh, because it has a, a long wavelength, um, doesn't get uh, absorbed by the types of molecules in the atmosphere. It's just too low energy to interact. So thinking back to that FET simulation, the color of light uh, that different molecules interact with uh, depends on their shape and it depends on their, you know, the atoms in the molecule. And radio doesn't interact with basically any gases. So it's really handy for imaging for that reason. And especially on Venus where you can't see through to the ground with visible. So radar, you've, you're probably familiar with, you know, radar as kind of the radar guns that police use to see if you're speeding, right? Um, so it sends a signal to the surface and then that radio bounces back. And based on the, the travel time that it takes to go there and back, you can calculate uh, the height of the surface. And so if you do that at many different points along the surface, you can map out the topography. Okay, so I saw most of you come up with similar feedback loops. Um, I chose to illustrate mine in maybe a different way. I tried to use color coding to describe which one of those were feedback loops that increase temperature and which of those are feedback loops that decrease surface temperature. Um, so um, the first thing is that uh, we don't really know if Venus did start with oceans on its surface or not. Um, it likely did start with liquid water, but we don't know um, whether that liquid water was definitely 
you know, condensed into oceans or whether the liquid water was kind of more transient and much of it was in the atmosphere during the entire evolution of that planet. Uh, anyway, here I assume that Venus did start with a liquid ocean. And um, in that case, because Venus is closer to the sun, it receives more solar radiation, so it has a higher equilibrium temperature. And so just that one factor alone, that the Venus has um, a higher equilibrium temperature than the Earth, causes more evaporation of water from the, from the ocean. Here, I'll turn on this little laser thing. Okay, so here's our water molecule sitting in the ocean. And um, you know, on, on either Earth or Venus, it's going to evaporate and then condense in the atmosphere in the form of clouds, which can then precipitate and fall back into the ocean. And this is a neutral process if uh, it's in balance, if there's not a you know, net increase of water vapor in the atmosphere or a net decrease of water vapor from this process. But where it starts to become a positive feedback loop is that water is indeed a greenhouse gas. So more water vapor in the atmosphere does lead to some uh, increased heating of the surface, which then in turn can help to evaporate more water from the ocean. So this is our first example of a positive feedback loop that results in increased warming uh, kind of ad nauseum, right? Uh, the other process is the carbon dioxide. So we can follow the water, but we can also follow the carbon dioxide. And it can either be you know, dissolved in the oceans, bound to surface rocks or hanging out in the atmosphere. And um, with increased temperature, more of that CO2 um, can be forced out of the water. More CO2 can outgas from rocks. And um, so then the process of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere is that it dissolves in water and precipitates onto the rocks. And that's where it can then be locked onto rocks. So there's actually two processes here. One is just a gas exchange from dry rock and the other is weathering of rock that locks away CO2. Okay, so um, how does this form a positive feedback loop? Uh, if there is increased surface heating, there will be more outgassing of carbon dioxide from the rock. And so that will lead to further heating, which will then lead to further release of this gas. So that's why this arrow here is part of this feedback loop. It doesn't really have, you know, uh, a way, a good way to pull more CO2 out of the walk, out of the atmosphere. Um, this process is a little bit simplified because there are differences in how common precipitation is at higher temperatures too. So on Earth, when we have more CO2 in the atmosphere from, uh, you know, throughout the planet's history, when that has happened due to say uh, volcanic outgassing and events, then it, it has tended to be balanced by uh, weathering on the surface. And, you know, th that's managed by the presence of liquid water that can precipitate and then weather those surface rocks and bind that CO2. But on Venus, its main problem is that the water that made it into the atmosphere um, was degraded by UV radiation, broken into its hydrogen and hydroxide, the OH part. And both of those then are too light for the planet's gravity to hold on to. And so those have escaped. So as a result, Venus has lost its water. Uh, the same process hasn't happened on Earth because it hasn't reached a, um, a high enough temperature for most of the water vapor to be forced into the atmosphere in the same way. So for now, our oceans are safe. Um, and the presence of liquid water helps to you know, provide this cooling effect, this blue arrow on Earth. And when Venus lost its water, it lost the opportunity for that um, weathering to contribute to a negative feedback loop, one that contributes to cooling. So in the case of Earth, some increased warming is, uh, you know, can, these positive feedback loops all still apply, but it has this mechanism of a negative feedback loop as well. So that's one way that Earth's um, atmospheric and climate system is very different than Venus's and why we've ended up so different. 